Welcome back to the 6Ps podcast and today's episode is going to be a guided reading of the prologue from the Women of Troy. This is of course the Don Taylor version. To give you a quick summary of the prologue, initially Hecuba, the Queen of Troy, lies on the ground throughout and that's mentioned in the stage directions. Poseidon and Athena to or God and a goddess discuss recent events in Troy and provides us with some background information. And this is, of course, the role of the prologue to introduce the audience to the setting and some of the events that have preceded what is about to appear on stage. Now, Poseidon and Athena agree to a pact to ensure the Greek army are punished for their behavior towards the Trojans. And they talk a little bit about the events that have happened in the Trojan War. Before you start reading, I definitely recommend that you read the introductory pages, which come up just before the text. Um, These are notes from Don Taylor himself. Um, Really important because it provides you with some of that background information, uh, as well as some of the reasoning behind um, when and why the play was written, and why I guess it's so um, realistic or has such importance or significance in contemporary society. But let's begin our reading. So the prologue begins with stage directions, which outline where we are, which is the ruins of Troy, that Hecuba is lying face down and quite still. Enter the god Poseidon. Definitely encourage you all, in fact, you should all be at some stage quoting the stage directions in your essay. They provide important information. You shouldn't just be relying on what the characters say. Now in this version, we have the characters who speak their names in bold and what they say beneath that. So here we have Poseidon. He's the god of the ocean and patron of Troy. And he says, I have come here from the bottom of the sea, the salt waters of the Aegean, where the daughters of Nereus, 50 sea nymphs in chorus, circle in their intricate and beautiful dance. My name is Poseidon. I am a god. I built this city with Apollo, who is the god of light. I built it. Every stone we laid, every tower, even the walls we dressed and leveled with plumb line and mason's square. So I've always had a particular love for this city of the Virgins. Virgins are, of course, another way of saying um, Trojans. And look at it now, a smoking ruin devastated by the power of the Greek war machine. A couple of things to make note of here, the imagery of Troy being a smoking ruin and the description of the Greek army as a Greek war machine. There's a real lack of emotion here. I think as well we see some parallels already to the Athenian, the Athenian army of the time. Now a Phocian inventor, Phocia is a place in central Greece, by the name of Epius, who lived in Parnassus with skills he learnt from Athena, and probably with her help designed and built a horse, whose capacious belly was pregnant with armed commandos, and managed to get it, together with its murderous payload, inside the walls, so that no one in the future will ever forget the stratagem that goes by the name of the wooden horse, nor the ferocious strike force it concealed. This is of course some background information about the Trojan War, which was won by the Greek army after they gifted the Trojans a wooden horse. They offered it as a bit of a peace deal, but of course inside were the Greek soldiers who at night came out and killed all the men. And now, the temple gardens are deserted and puddles of blood smear the sanctuaries. Again, we've got that imagery there to describe what has happened in Troy. And the sanctuaries of all the gods, so there's been disrespectful behavior towards the gods. King Priam lies dead on the steps of the temple of Zeus, protector of the city. Notice here how the king has gone to Zeus's temple, but the gods, unfortunately, have failed Troy. More gold than can be counted, and anything soldiers can loot finds its way down to the Greek ships. And all they're waiting for now is a following wind, so that after 10 years, and ten sowing seasons, they can joyfully set 
their eyes on their wives and children, these Greeks who brought an army to sack Troy. So, just to note there, the fact that they have been away, the Greek soldiers have been away for 10 years. Um, that's, I guess, the life of a soldier, being away from home, away from their wives and away from their children. A bit of a reference here again to the Athenian soldiers, but also an outline of, of the Greek way of life and, 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 and war in, in itself. Something to note too that we know that the journey home will actually last 10 years as well. And this will be information that the audience knows, of course, the Odyssey and its journey home. Now, as for me, I have been defeated. Two by Athena and Hera, goddesses who supported the Greeks and who between them have utterly devastated this city of the virgins. So Athena is the goddess of wisdom and of course the patron of Athens as her name suggests. Again we get some description about what has happened to Troy. It's been utterly devastated. So now I too shall desert famous Troy and all those temples, sorry, and all those altars and temples raised in my name. For when a town is destroyed and becomes a wilderness, all worship ceases and there's no longer anything left worth a god's consideration. That's a really great quote to show that the gods have in fact abandoned Troy. We know the important role the gods played in um, Greek society in terms of their role to protect um, humans, and, and here they've sort of left them, abandoned them. Now the riverbank of the Scamander echoes with the screams and moans of captured women again echoing what happened in Melos, as various Greek lords draw lots for them and they become their slaves. Arcadian princes draw some, Thessalonians others, and the princes of Athens, Theseus' descendants, get their share. All the women of Troy who have not yet been allocated are in this building here. They have been reserved for the leaders of the Greek army, and with them, a prisoner like the rest, and quite right too, is the Spartan daughter of Tyndareus, Helen. The audience, of course, would know who Helen is, and we sort of touched on her briefly in the background information. She'll come up later on in the play as well, and many individuals blame her for what happened to Troy. In fact, Hecuba particularly blames Helen for what has happened. She, of course, is not punished in the end, and the audience too will know that. Something to note here as well is the treatment of women, particularly after the war, they are treated as, as objects, and again, they draw lots for them. But to see the true face of misery, you need to look no further than the poor creature lying here in front of the gate, Hecuba, who of course is the Queen of Troy whose unnumbered tears match the numberless dead she grieves for. Her daughter, Polexena, has been secretly and brutally murdered at the tomb of Achilles. Once again, look at the language that's being used here. And at the tomb of Achilles, again, we get this reference to the disrespect shown towards the gods. In payment for his death, Prem is dead too and her sons by him, and her daughter Cassandra, the frenzied visionary, whom even the god Apollo left untouched as a virgin, Agamemnon, intends to make his concubine a dangerous business, best kept in the dark, that flouts all religious feeling. There is a lot to take in here. Firstly, Cassandra, who the audience will be very familiar with. She is a prophetess. She can see into the future, but no one else can see her. And again, She's been untouched as a virgin by the god Apollo, yet Agamemnon is going to make her his concubine, which is like a sex slave. Again, um, a concubine, I guess, is, is a woman with less power than, say, a wife. So he doesn't plan to make her his wife, but more so just a sex slave. There is a real lack of morality here from Agamemnon, who is the leader of the Greek army, um, and he's going to be punished for his behavior eventually. Again, the audience is very much aware of that. Well then, most prosperous of cities, home of the rich and fortunate, it is time to say goodbye. Shining towers and citadels, farewell forever. If Pallas Athena, daughter of Zeus, had not determined to destroy you, 
your foundations will be as firm and solid as ever they were. Interesting to note that Poseidon blames Athena. And blame is an important theme throughout this text. We see that many of the characters look to blame others for the events that have happened. And then we get our stage direction, which of course comes um, in the in the um, um, in the case of Athena entering. And Athena says, "May old antagonism be forgotten. I have something to say to you, brother of my father, great god as you are, whom other gods honour. Certainly, it may we are blood relations, Queen Athena, and that warms my heart. You are generous to say so." The question at issue is a matter of equal concern to both of us. What is it? Some new dispensation, which means like an exemption, from the gods, from Zeus himself, or some other divinity? No, it concerns Troy, on whose ground we now stand. I want to make a pact to join your power to mine. Again, this war has been fought between the Greek army and Troy, and we see these two gods sort of on either side, but Athena presents the opportunity for a pact between the two gods. Poseidon says, is that so? You pity your ancient enemy now. You see her a smoke-blackened ruin, do you? Again, we get some more imagery here of Troy. That's not the point. First, give me your answer. Will you join me and help to carry out my plan? By all means, though, I'd be glad to know what it is. Are you helping the Greeks now, or the Trojans? My former enemies, says Athene, the Trojans, will be comforted. I shall make the Greeks return home a disaster. This, of course, is in relation to Homer's epic, the Odyssey. And they'll know that it takes the Greek army 10 years to make it. Not everyone, of course, makes it home. A somewhat cavalier change of mind. Surely cavalier meaning flippant. Are you usually so casual whom you love or hate? A really good quote here to show the gods in this case being depicted as, well, flawed really and quite human. It's a really interesting depiction and one that wouldn't have been too common in classical Greek time, the way the gods are sort of portrayed in this case. Athena then says, haven't you heard I've been insulted and my temple has been desecrated? Notice how the gods only act here when they've been personally insulted or personally affronted. Poseidon says, yes, I know. When Ajax dragged Cassandra from sanctuary, the Greeks didn't punish him, not even a reprimand. Again, we see the corrosion of morality on the part of the Greek army, which again reflects what happened with the Athenian army in Melos. Poseidon says, When your power has enabled them to bring Troy to its knees, I shall punish them for that with your help. So Athene again showing her humanity, saying she will punish the Greek army for their behaviour. I am entirely at your service. What can I do? I want their voyage home to be a disaster, or a complete disaster, before they set sail around at sea. Now when they have left Troy and are nearing home, Zeus has promised me a savage hailstorm, torrential rain and gale force winds in the middle of the night, and he's given me the use of his thunderbolts to strike the Greek ships with lightning and burn them at sea. Nice juxtaposition here with the burning at sea, the fire and the water. Your task will be to make the Aegean heave with mountainous waves, every third wave even higher than the rest, and swirl and eddy the salt waters with dangerous whirlpools, and fill the whole bay of Euboa with floating corpses so thick you could walk on them. Again, some imagery about what Athena wants to see. So that the Greeks will learn their lesson, and in future, respect my temples, and fear the power of the gods. And this is something that's really important here. Um, that fear, in this case, allows the gods to maintain their power. Poseidon says... Athena, you need not waste more words. I shall do that with pleasure. The whole Aegean from the shores of Mykonos and the rocks of Delos to Skyros and Lemnos and the headlands of Kephiria and the open salt sea I shall whip up to a foam so the number of the drowned will be beyond counting. You get off to Olympus now. Get hold of the thunderbolts and watch your opportunity when the Greek fleet casts off home. 
For when the Greek, for when a man sacks a town and destroys everything, even the sacred temples and the tombs of the dead, he's asking for trouble. The same destruction sooner or later will fall on his own head. Exit Athena and Poseidon. That last quote is a great one to remember. Firstly, I guess it warns men who neglect their duty to the gods and their duty to be, I guess, moral. Uh, Euripides is clearly speaking to the Athenians here and sort of discussing their actions in Melos and the fact that they too will be punished. And we see a bit of foreshadowing here as well. Of course, the audience will be already aware about what happens to the Greek army on their way home and what happens to their leader, Agamemnon. And that's where the prologue ends because Hecuba comes on stage later to start the next section. So let's have a look at some key themes in this particular section. The first one, obviously, is is war. Poseidon outlines and describes the consequences of war for the victims, um, women being enslaved, the men being killed, towns being destroyed, temples being desecrated, um, you know, everything really. It also outlines the brutality of war, particularly the suffering of the women here. We also take note that the gods play an important role. They, of course, the two characters that speak in the prologue and the message that if you disrespect the gods, that they will punish you. If they feel like they have been affronted, they will seek vengeance, which is quite, I guess, a human emotion, this feeling of wanting revenge. The last point talks about female suffering. I mentioned that briefly earlier, but we get some great quotations to describe that. Speaking of quotations, let's look at some key quotations. I've just picked out three here. There are many more you, you, you could look at. Um, this imagery, a smoking ruin to describe Troy, devastated by the power of the Greek war machine. Even that description is quite vivid of the Greek army. Again, some more a language which describes the pain and suffering of the women, the screams and moans of captured women, and then the quotation at the end to describe Agamemnon's behaviour, it being a dangerous business, best kept dark in the dark that flouts all religious feeling, and Agamemnon eventually will be killed at the hands of his wife. 